Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session of today. Who's ready for happy hour after? <laughs> awesome. Um, let's welcome Victor Clark. He's going to be presenting Strange Ways, Here We Come, a journey from on-prem to cloud first with AWS. Welcome, Victor. All right. All right, hello, B-Sides. Very excited to be here. First, let me apologize for being the single thing standing in between you and happy hour. Um, but hopefully, you'll enjoy the uh, session as much as I will. OK, so the um, theme for this year's B-Sides is the 1980s. Let's take a journey back the year 1987. It was a good year. I remember it well. Uh, one of my favorite bands of all time, The Smiths, released uh, their last studio album, Strange Ways, Here We Come. And that's the perfect title for this talk, because when you're going from on-prem to on the cloud, it's a different way of doing things. It's a different way of thinking. It can be a little strange. Also, a very popular technology back in the 80s was the PC turbo button. Now, my VIC-20 at the time didn't have a turbo button, but that's OK. It doesn't matter. Um, for this presentation, we'll have our own turbo buttons in the, in the way of lessons learned, some cool tricks for the different um, moving parts of AB AWS that we'll be working with. OK, cool. So for all of you social engineering folks out there, I'm Victor Clark. I am the cloud security engineer at Inside Engines. Uh, this summer marks my third year with the, uh, with the company. So when I joined, we were, I was the third or fourth engineer, and now we're about 15 people. So it's been a pretty good time. It's been a very exciting uh, journey so far. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, that's us on the web. And if you're interested in doing a disinformation campaign, you can find us on Twitter. So in addition to that, I'm also a husband and a father, and I can't wait until my kid starts asking me questions about the cloud, because I will definitely have answers for him. OK, tough crowd. Um, <laughs> OK, cool. So that's enough about me. How about, uh, about you? Why would you be here? Why, why would you be interested in this talk, um, AKA, why am I here and not at the EFF event? So if perhaps you're already cloud first, uh, I think that's great. Um, this could be a good sanity check of some of the things that you and your team do um, in AWS. And if you already do them, hey, maybe it'll be a great laugh for you. Um, if you're considering going cloud first, congratulations, you are in the correct spot. If you're leadership, we're going to talk strategy, the people and the processes you need to have in place. And if you're an individual contributor, you know, we'll also talk about um, uh, strategy to, sorry, tactics uh, to get you going cloud first. Cool, so let's talk strategy. Um, hiring, I'm going to go ahead and assume that you already have a lead architect in place, somebody who, can, who knows the implications of taking your, your, your application from on-prem um, to in the cloud. Uh, maybe it's you, maybe it's somebody on your team. Second, you're going to need an individual contributor, someone who can develop and manage this infrastructure hands-on, because it's definitely a full-time job. Um, on my current team, that is one of the roles that I fill. Third, and I can't say this enough, you definitely need a QA testing lead, because the code that you develop is only as good as the tests um, that you run against it. And it is a full-time job developing uh, these testing pipelines. So there are different cloud platforms that you can go with. I'm going to talk about AWS, but there are you know, a couple of others that you could go with as well. I'm just going to go ahead and answer the question, because someone's going to ask me. They're all great. I've used uh, all, all three of the major cloud platforms, but they also have their limitations as well. Um, the, each uh, cloud platform is going to have a credits program, so I would definitely suggest that you leverage that if you can. Um, it shouldn't be the determining factor, but just go ahead and, and use that to your advantage if it's there. Um, it would also be a good idea to talk to your stakeholders, um, folks that you work with or investors or your board, see what their preferences are when it comes to the cloud. They may be different than your preferences, and have that discussion. If any friction comes up, it may be good to just go ahead and have those discussions ahead of time. And then regardless of what, um, which platform you develop on, I guarantee you're going to run undocumented requirements. That's just kind of how it goes. You know, if we weren't developing on, on the cloud, we would be, I'm sure, reading manuals about the Linux kernel. So for your technology stack, there are um, different um, solutions that you could go with. Um, pretty much anything, any moving part that you need, you're going to run into um, a hosted solution, or you could potentially roll your own. Um, if you would prefer to roll your own, I definitely would point you to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. There have been a lot of great products that have been out in the past uh, year or so. Um, Kubernetes, um, Prometheus, uh, Envoy, these are all really great products. And uh, I'm sure there'll be more in the coming year. 
Uh, finally, the data and retention policies. You know, if you're going to be cloud first, you're going to need to be able to collect people's information and hold it. Unfortunately, there is no one size fits all answer for this. Um, I wish there were, but it really depends on your product and what you're trying to do. And then I would suggest that you plan for success and um, try to be GDPR, GDPR compliant um, from the jump. Cool, so let's talk architecture. Um, so our flagship product at Insight, uh, at Insight Engines is Investigator. And so this is a natural language solution that fits on top of Splunk. Splunk is a really great product. I love using it. They're one of the um, sponsors of this event this year. Um, so in Investigator sits on top of Splunk. And so um, you can ask a plain English question. It's parsed by the um, engine and then compiled into SPL. So instead of uh, executing a huge SPL query, you can ask a question like, you know, show me endpoints with malware traffic in the past 30 days. And after it talks with our API, you know, you're issued a, a, a large uh, SPL query. If you're interested in knowing, knowing more about how we turn this from an on-prem product to a multi-tenant microservice, definitely check out this talk by my colleague and Inside Engine's founding team member and lead architect, Naveen Kumar. He gave a really great talk at um, Pi Bay um, in this past September. Cool, so there are some, obviously some um, on, um, uh, limitations when you develop for on-prem. If you are, um, uh, so if you, if you're dealing with a customer who has a, a very short change window and you're not able to install the, um, the application, you know, that can be very difficult if you sort of miss your window there. Um, this can make it very difficult to um, develop, um, to, uh, to del deliver new features, to squash bug fixes and that sort of thing. Um, so, um, you know, with considering the, the, the limitations of on-prem, you're faced with the biggest question probably in Silicon Valley. Um, no, not that question. I'm so glad somebody laughed, because I swear you guys were not going to laugh at that. Um, but, will, but will it scale? And so the question is a resounding uh, no. So that's why we went uh, cloud first. Cool, so what does that look like when you go cloud first from being on-prem? So instead of installing the natural language engine, and actually instead of being installed, it gets migrated to the cloud. And instead of installing, installing the natural language engine, you install an API client that talks to an API in order to communicate with the natural language engine. Cool, so then what does that look like when you have uh, infrastructure in the cloud? You know, you're just making a request, you're getting a response. I wish I could tell you that it actually was this simple. It's a little bit more complex than that. So this is what uh, the moving parts in our cloud look like. This, it seems pretty simple that there's just a handful of parts. Um, there's also supporting infrastructure uh, beyond this as well. This represents about uh, roughly 1,000 lines of infrastructure as code. And so I'll talk more about that in just a moment. But first, I want to talk about the lifetime of a request um, before we talk about the actual moving parts in the cloud. Cool. So uh, the, the end user at their, um, at their endpoint submits a query. The API client then wraps up that query as an API request and also sends some headers along for authentication and authorization. The um, request is received by API Gateway over an encrypted channel. A API Gateway is um, the AWS service for uh, routing requests. And we have authentication that's handled by uh, Cognito. Everything goes well, so then you're routed back to API Gateway, which then will put you in touch with a VPC link. VPC link is very powerful because it routes you into a, uh, a private cloud, which means that none of your infrastructure within uh, this region here has to, has to be facing the public internet. It's uh, very useful. Um, from there, your traffic is routed to a network load balancer that routes traffic to um, a container cluster running in Fargate. This is where we actually moved our natural language engine um, to, um, now it has been refactored to work as a cluster of containers within Fargate. And finally, if you need to access any databases, those are also in uh, the cloud as well. You access them uh, by Secrets Manager. Cool, so for the rest of the time, let's talk about the different moving parts of AWS. Um, first, you definitely want to automate as much of this deployment as possible. Um, so for AWS, you can use CloudFormation for that, and so this is what I referred to as infrastructure as code. It's just this declarative uh, file format that you then push up to AWS, and AWS takes care of building out um, all the moving parts for you. 
So you can kind of think of this as a way of, to do um, security configurations because all the hardening that you do for all your various uh, pieces of infrastructure that's going to be uh, stored within CloudFormation as your, um, as your source of truth. It's also very useful for disaster recovery. Let's say you have something that one of your um, pieces of infrastructure just like goes down for whatever reason and it's outside of your control. Um, you can just uh, run uh, CloudFormation again. You can have up and running in just a few minutes. Um, cool, so I talked a little bit about um, having different turbo buttons. So the turbo buttons for CloudFormation are combining with configuration management and also internal references within CloudFormation. So what I mean by configuration management are products like Salt, Ansible, um, uh, Chef Puppet, those sorts of things. And so the way it would look like would be this. So you have a runbook that has a set of instructions that works with um, CloudFormation that parses a file full of variables that say has like maybe your region, your um, you know uh, you know what what availability zone you're going to be working in, that sort of thing. Um, if you have a certain name for um, an image that you're deploying up to uh, Fargate, uh, those sorts of variables. And so that populates a template, a CloudFormation template. Then when you're done, you have this full CloudFormation file that you then push up to AWS, and it's able to um, spin up all the all all of your uh, all the moving parts of your cloud. So for internal references, this really helps to make CloudFormation um, its own um, standalone um, file so that you can do cool things like check in the version control and that sort of thing. So this is a small uh, section of a CloudFormation uh, template that creates a VPC link, again, that puts you into the private cloud. Um, so the two uh, declarations that you want to, sorry, directives that you want to pay attention to here are depends on. Uh, the VPC link needs a network load balancer to actually point to before it can actually be up and running. And then uh, you want to point it to a specific target ARN. So an ARN is an AW is an Amazon resource number. Usually it's a really long, complicated stream. So instead of doing something weird like copying and pasting it, you can just make a reference to uh, this object that you call network load balancer within your CloudFormation template. And so it really helps it to be this um, self-contained uh, file. Cool, so let's talk a little bit about CloudWatch. Um, this touches all parts of uh, the cloud infrastructure as well. Um, so this is a centralized logging service from AWS, and this is something that where you could talk an entire uh, B-side session about this. And I should know because I attended one last year, so shout out to Jonathan Pulling. Um, go and check it out on YouTube. It's really great, very informative. I definitely got a lot out of it. So you definitely want to monitor, monitor every moving part that you possibly can. Um, you know, the old saying that that which is measured is managed, uh, this is no different. And so your turbo button here, there are a couple of things that you can do. So you can create alarms based on your different logging that you're doing. So let's say you're getting a lot of you know, 400 errors out of uh, API Gateway or 503. Um, you can create alarms based on those metrics. And so you can take action on that, say you know, maybe something is weird you know, downstream, maybe something's weird with your network load balancer or something's going on with your, um, uh, your container cluster. So you can also integrate this with incident management. So something like um, a pager duty, uh, for example, where you can uh, have an integration where your team can actually take action against uh, the different alarms that will pop up. And then finally, you can do uh, uh, filter and pattern matching, which is really uh, useful. So this is all, so if you do a search against all of your logs within API Gateway, you can search for, say, all the requests that return status 200. This becomes very powerful if you want to, say, search against you know, status that are not equal to 200. And so you can start seeing all the errors that are being returned. And if you see something that looks kind of out of the ordinary, um, you can take um, action on it. So this is actually very powerful. There was at least one time where I was able to detect an AWS outage before I got the notice from AWS. Um, so that was pretty pretty cool to be able to um, uh, to be able to have that sort of insight. Uh, cool. So moving right along, um, IAM, which is Identity and Access Management. Um, so this is how you delegate access to your internal users and also infrastructure as well. So that probably sounds pretty weird to be like, well, how does my infrastructure have you know have have different roles, different access? So AWS has this concept of an AWS execution role where you have uh, the most granular level permissions that you have within AWS are a bunch of permissions, which are basically like a JSON blob that you can then put into um, a policy, and then all, a bunch of policies can be put into a role. So this becomes very useful if, say, you need something like your container um, cluster needs to talk to things like, you know, several things like Secrets Manager and, and other services as well. Um, so this, those of you who are familiar, this probably sounds a little similar to uh, role-based access control. 
OK, cool. So let's start talking about the um, individual parts of um, AWS, um, specifically to networking. Um, so we have uh, the virtual private cloud, which is like the entire set of, uh, of uh, networks, uh, uh, IP addresses that can be used uh, by your infrastructure within your cloud. Subnets, which are just a subset of those um, addresses, route tables, so that your subnets can talk to each other. Security groups. So someone had mentioned security groups in the question, uh, the question session of the last um, of the last talk. So security groups are a um, set of addresses, um, protocols, and ports which allow for communication to your various um, parts of your infrastructure. Things like a database or a virtual um, virtual machine. Access control lists. Those are exactly the same thing, but those are applied uh, to subnets. So you have a couple of different turbo buttons here that you could potentially use. Um, if you're going to have, I strongly encourage you to have security groups and access control lists, um, but also make sure that they agree. So for example, if you have a MySQL database that's running on you know, 3306 and you have the correct security group for that, um, but you don't allow that in the access control list of the subnet that the database belongs to, um, you're going to have a bad time. Cool. And then so um, that's ingress, but then there's also egress as well. So um, by default, whenever you create security groups and access control lists, um, by, de by default, they are quad zero. So definitely take the time to lock those down. Um, if you only need to talk to your virtual private cloud, you know, make sure you, you set that address um, range appropriately. Cool. All right. So let's start talking about the actual parts of the, um, that the requests touch. So API gateway, which is downstream of the API request. So this handles uh, request routing within um, AWS. So this can point to things like a VPC link if you need to point to send it along to other pieces of the infrastructure. Or it could just be a Lambda function if you just need to render some page or return some JSON response, something like that. A couple of different security mechanisms that you can use here. Um, if someone is being really abusive, they're just giving you a hard time, you can rate limit um, their API key. And if they still keep giving you a really hard time, you can just outright delete their, uh, deactivate their API key. Um, you can also leverage ti uh, integration timeouts as well. So if you have an integration that you know should take X amount of time, um, you can set that integration time limit so you don't have some uh, long-lived um, request going on in your API gateway to a maximum of 29 seconds. Cool, so th there's a turbo button that you can leverage within uh, API gateway. It's a little, um, uh, it can be a little complex with the way that I'm going to show it. So if you all would please forgive the majorly redacted um, screenshot here. So we all, I'm sure we all have uh, DNS registers that we use for you know, our, our various roles at our companies. But I would uh, strongly recommend if you're going to use API Gateway, um, use the, have the DNS managed by AWS. So you can have a certificate for whatever domain you're interested in uh, issued by Amazon uh, Certificate Manager. And then from there, what, how this becomes really powerful is that you can set different endpoints within your API to point to different parts of infrastructure, like you know, a different VPC link or something like that. Um, so let's say if you are deploying an, um, an upgrade, then you could have you know, both versions of your code base uh, running in the same, um, in the same uh, API gateway. And so instead of you know, having some downtime or um, updating the DNS record with your registrar, you just like flip a bit with an, a with an API gateway. And so this really is very powerful. It can uh, equate to you know, nearly a zero, a zero downtime if you're doing an upgrade. Cool. All right, so moving along, let's talk about uh, Cognito. And so this is the part that handles um, authentication for users uh, with API Gateway. So this is for um, user management. And you can, the really nice thing is that you can have, it offers you an app client for users sign up and login, and also um, has a, offers a user database as well. So I have this on the public part of uh, the diagram, but I just want to be clear that your user database is not public. There are public facing parts. Of, of Cognito, like, this, like sign up and log in, but your database is definitely not accessible by the public. All right, so your uh, turbo button. Let's talk about my favorite thing in the world, um, OAuth. So for an authorization code grant flow, um, it looks a little something like this. So at some point, um, Cognito is going to expect that you're going to return it a key value pair of location and some URL. This URL has a bunch of query string parameters, and it can be kind of difficult or weird to try and find where those um, or those different uh, bits of information are. So you can get the um, Amazon Cognito domain name that's provided to you um, within the app integration. And then same thing for the client ID and the um, redirect URL. 
You can also find those in the app client settings. One really frustrating thing for me was that callback URL is put in, uh, was put uh, for the redirect URI. And, you know, it, it would be nice if like the um, the verbiage was the same there. But you know, pretty pretty straightforward to figure out once once you get a handle on things. All right, so downstream of API Gateway and Cognito is VPC Link and Network Load Balancer. So VPC Link, this is, again, an integration endpoint. Um, you have a maximum of five per account. So when you are designing um, for Cloud First, just be aware of that, that you don't have an unlimited number of VPC links. Uh, the Network Load Balancer, as the name would imply, routes traffic on layer four and uses the hash algorithm for uh, load balancing. So uh, your turbo button here, make sure that you have cross-zone enabled such that, um, let's say you have uh, a bunch of containers distributed in different um, subnets unevenly, it will, uh, it will route traffic uh, based to the number of containers that you have, not necessarily based on which subnet it's in. And I had to learn this the hard way. Please do not perform your health checks from a network load balancer unless you're interested in DDoSing yourself. So that's just an example of what um, Cloud, uh, CloudFormation template looks like for VPC link and network load balancer. Cool, all right, so in the home stretch here, uh, Fargate and EC2. So Fargate is uh, downstream of the network load balancer. This is the managed container service um, from AWS. Um, so to reiterate, if you're interesting, interested in sort of rolling your own technology here, definitely look in the Kubernetes. That is uh, definitely an option that you could use here. So if you're uh, migrating from on-prem to in the cloud, this is probably where you're going to put most of your logic. Um, and if you can containerize it, I think that's great. Um, so your turbo button here. So definitely no public access for this um, container cluster. You can actually declare that. So a shout out to Omar Hammerman. I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Um, they wrote a very great article called uh, Blog Post, uh, Deploying Fargate Services Using CloudFormation. So if you are interested in using Fargate, search for this blog post, bookmark it, check it out. It definitely solved a lot of problems for me. Okay, so if you will forgive the ceiling to floor um, screenshot here. I don't know, I think Stanley Kubrick would be proud. Um, so if you, so to give you an example of what that would look like with the um, with cloud formation and uh, Fargate, uh, this is what the network configuration looks like. And you can see there that the, um, Public IP has been disabled, so you can uh, rest assured it's not exposed to the public uh, internet. And then this is your task definition, which is basically how you define your containers within the cluster. So some of the tips from um, Omar Hammerman's uh, blog post, you will need to uh, declare an execution role and also a task, um, a task role ARN as well. Uh, your network no mode will need to be uh, AWS VPC. And then for logging configuration, you're definitely going to have to specify an AWS log stream prefix uh, value. So in addition to that, I had mentioned that don't do your health checks from your network load balancer. Instead, do them from your container. And so this is what that would look like. Um, if you're interested in sort of building out something a little bit more complex than this, um, check out the Docker API. This is how I was able to um, configure this. Cool, and then also, if you're familiar with containers, you know that you're only going to get access to any sort of um, ports that you expose. So you know, let's say if you, if you did have this exposed to um, the public internet and someone was trying to SSH in, you know, unless you've exposed port 22, you should be good. All right, last moving part. Cool, so RDS, which is the databases that live within the um, virtual private cloud of AWS. Uh, there are several different ways that you can harden this. I'm sure that if you are using um, AWS, you'd be very interested in this because this is where your user data um, and other data per is uh, persisted. First, please put it in a virtual private cloud, in a virtual subnet and then uh, assign it to a hardened security group. And again, make sure this has no public access. You're probably seeing um, a theme here of, um, of security in depth. 
So your turbo button is that you can, if you need to access the databases, you can hold those secrets within Secrets Manager. Secrets Manager is not a public-facing service with AWS. It's only accessed by an API, and if you have the correct IAM permissions for that. Um, so that's been uh, very useful, so you don't have to hold you know, credentials or something like that um, in, uh, in a code repo or anything like that. Cool. All right. So that's what this looks like uh, if you're declaring, if you are creating an RDS instance using uh, CloudFormation. You can see that it is not publicly accessible. Um, it has, it belongs to this subnet um, and this security group. So I talked a little bit about security groups. You know, what the what do those look like? Um, so this is how it looks like if you were to declare a security group along with the ingress and egress um, rules as well. Um, so the cool thing to note here is that this is, um, um, that this is protocol six, so it's TCP, um, and you can only uh, have ingress into uh, the um, subnet if you are on the certain port for the uh, port Postgres, which you know, if you're familiar with Postgres, uh, 5432. And then for egress, um, the interesting thing here is that you can only have egress to the sitter block IP, which is uh, the local VPC um, sitter block. Cool, all right, so that wraps it up for me. Um, before um, I wrap things up here, I just wanna say thank you to all the volunteers who put on this um, event every year. I really look forward to it. It's one of the highlights of the year for me. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and so um, with that, I guess we can all go to happy hour. So thank you. We have like four minutes for questions, Victor. Does anyone have any questions? No questions? Everyone wants to go to happy hour? Oh. <laughs> um, what recommendations do you have for uh, when your resources that are spun up by CloudFormation, like when they go down, not everything has a health check or right. they can be tampered with. Right. So do you have uh, detections and then automated responses for those cases? Uh, yeah, so something that would be uh, very useful if, if you think that there is, um, uh, like it, it it would be good where if um, you can have an entire cloud formation template that uh, that deploys your entire cloud. And if there, if you can have like smaller subsets of that, say like something like goes down for whatever reason, you don't have to deploy like your entire thing again. You just deploy like the, the uh, stack of infrastructure that failed. Um, so uh, you know you can um, you know monitor on, on various uh, parts of the infrastructure. Um, but you know that might be part of your incident response is, oh, I, I saw this part of the infrastructure went down. Well, that means I have to run this playbook and this VARS file. Yeah. Does that uh, answer your question? Yes. Cool, awesome. So when you like uh, respond to that and then you run like a playbook, like an Ansible yep. uh, playbook, th that part is sort of manual. Uh, yeah, it's manual in that you just have to you know, run like a command in your shell, yeah. There's a question online, Victor. Uh, uh -oh. Do you have any recommendations on how to bring your developers up to speed when migrating from on-prem to AWS? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, when we uh, started this journey, um, we definitely talked a lot about what it would take to uh, go from on-prem to in the cloud. Um, you know, I, I, I would have meetings with my infrastructure team, uh, QA, and also the lead architect. Um, so, the, and whenever we would need to um, fold in the other developers, we would usually bring, you know, keep them up to date maybe like once a month or something like that. Um, but, you know, if there are any, you know, any sort of like roadblocks that you would um, anticipate along the way, you know, it's just good to sort of like have like, you know, share that with everyone at the beginning of this project. So that way it can kind of help you um, manage expectations that way. So I'm assuming this is all an existing production application. So yep. what were some of the things you had to deal with to make sure that you didn't have any customer downtime and make it completely transparent, especially like migrating credentials? Right, right. So um, so for um, transparency, we definitely use um, the Sari app. And so the, anyone who registers with our product, um, they're registered with, with that service. So that anytime we need to like have like a downtime, we say, hey, you know, it's gonna be at 2 p.m. You know, next Tuesday. It's gonna be for three hours, uh, that sort of thing. Luckily, we didn't have to uh, migrate any sort of credentials because you know, the credentials beforehand were living on on-prem for each user. So then we had to get them to sign up with the API service. So uh, luckily, we were able to avoid that, that potential headache. One last question online. Uh, with regards to hiring, what are some of the areas of expertise needed for that team? Yeah, so uh, 
It's funny, I actually got this question also at the, at the last uh, meetup that, that I spoke at. Um, so, uh, Site Reliability Engineer is actually pretty hot right now, and that's because it's a full-time job keeping this stuff up and running. Um, anytime that, you know, we have like an outage or something like that, um, you know, that takes time away from developing like, you know, new features and things like that. Um, so if you're comfortable or have experience with managing infrastructure like this, keeping a service up and running, um, those sorts of things, that's, you know, really great. Um, you know, cloud-specific um, skills aren't super important because, you know, if you are familiar with distributed computing on one platform, you can probably pick it up in another platform as well. Great. Um, on behalf of B-Sides, Victor, we thank you for your presentation. Oh, thanks. Awesome. Thank you.